All right, welcome to OS. With the NS lesson, you should be able to allow users to create accounts. This is a three-part process that we're going to do for OS. First part is signing up. If you're curious about how this fits in. Um, second step is uh, verifying a user's identity. So I made an account. Yeah, I'm the one who made that account, C. So verifying that somebody is who they say they are. And then the last step of this will be protecting resources. So this can be seen by authenticated user. This can't be. So we're focusing on this first one, creating an account. So what's going to happen is you have a sign-up form. And maybe have a username and a password. And then you're going to submit that username and password through HTTP. to a server. So if we weren't doing auth, if we were just doing regular old CRUD, then you add that user and their password to the database, and then you're kind of done. So we'll say 201, user got created. The thing that changes is we don't want to store their password. Why not? What's not secure about that? Yeah. How else are they going to be able to tell down the road that you are who you say you are? Uh oh. I'm Home Depot. You get my passwords database, and it's just a bunch of passwords. Yikes. Because you probably reuse those usernames and passwords on other sites. Also, when those things get disclosed, usually what happens is, oh shit, they've had this for six months. Uh-oh. So how do we get around that? If, I'm, if I can't store the password in the database, how do I know when they give me the password to log in, they're giving me the same password? Okay, so I could encrypt the password and put it in the database. Now, somebody steals my database, well, it's still kind of a problem. Because if they also figured out how to decrypt our thing, well, they have to work a little bit harder than if they were plain text, but they, can, they still essentially have all the passwords. And something like decryption, you get a powerful enough computer, just let it run for a little while, it'll crack it. Yikes. Token, what's a token? So if we're like flashing forward a little bit, that's exactly what we're going to do here. It, that's not why you don't have to enter in your username and password every time. Because you give me a token, I know that that's my token, we're good. Um, still doesn't solve the problem of how do I know to give them the token in the first place? Yeah, hashes. hashes, wonderful. So that's a lot of what we're going to work with today is hashes. How is a hash different than encrypting? Uh, so a hash is only, you can only do it one way. You can't undo it because uh, obviously that hash could be undone in very many ways. So you don't know what it really could be. Couldn't give a better description myself. So hashes are one way. I'll give you an example. Cat, I want to hash this. So Kyle's shitty hash is, we just take the like letter value of this. So that's a three, that's a one, I think this is a 17, 18, thank you. Cool, so I take the letter values of these, and I keep adding them together until I get one digit. So that's four, uh, four plus 18 is 22. So four is my hash. 
for this. Kyle's shitty ha 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 hashing algorithm turns cat into four. So the other thing that it does, so how is this not encryption? Didn't I just encrypt cat into four? Why not? It's saying four isn't A, 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 A. Yeah. So if I, oh no, that'd be three. Oh yeah, uh, if I do four A's. Yeah. Yeah, the hash for that is also four. Uh-oh. So the main idea there is just because I have the hash, I have no advantage in being able to reverse that back into what I originally had. Um, as Podrick said, there's millions, billions of different ways the same hash can become like the original thing. So when we're not doing Kyle shitty hash, when we're doing like a real hashing algorithm, the same thing is true. However, being able to intentionally create the same hash is so astronomically impossible that even if my password is cat and I get the hash for that, you being able to figure out something else that hashes that same value is just logistically impossible. That's hashing. Questions so far? What would a better hashing algorithm? Sure. Uh, you can look those up. You can also look them up in my knowledge wiki. So I, I think I've described at least one of them. Mm, hashing. So I can't, I might not have described how one, the mechanics of how one actually works, but like, this is, um, uh, these are like the characteristics of a good hashing function, is it makes good use of all the available bits, so whether you have a short one or a long one, it still uses everything, mm -hmm. that it's not reversible, um, and uh, uh, a thing called the avalanche property, which is if cat becomes car, that turns into a huge change in the resulting hash rather than a tiny change. So you want a small change to have a big difference. Um, MD5 uh, is probably, I think that's the one that bcrypt is based off of. But yeah, it's a, uh, it's a series of zors, uh, these little bitwise things. So, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a logical operation that doesn't reverse the same way that it goes forward. Okay. That's the TLDR on it. Other questions about hashes? All right, so how does this do anything to solve our problem here? I don't want to store the password. I can't encrypt the password and store that. Hashing the password, how does that fit into this? Think to yourself for a second, you're calling someone. John, how do you think that works? Um, well, if you hash the password, you should then probably use that to uh, you know, use that exact screw around the sign up to the token. Okay, so I hash the password here. This is still my sign up. Mm -hmm. What do I do? I have a password hash. Yeah, you have a password hash. Now what? You need to probably attach that to the user. Yep. Where? Within the user database. Yes, that's exactly what you do. So in the database, I'm storing their username and their password hash. So we're going to call that their digest, password digest. 
Username password comes over, pass the password, store the username and the hash password in the database. Okay, so cool. And that's what we're gonna do today. That's all we're gonna do today. But how does that help us in this next lesson? When I'm trying to figure out if somebody is who they say they are. That's it. So if the password they send me for login hashes to the same thing that I stored, I know I have a very good high level of confidence that it's the same thing. They could have typed any number of other things in that would give the same hash. The odds that they can do that intentionally, fucking zero. Because like if your password is cat, car isn't also going to give you the same hash, small change, big change. So the thing that would ha a thing that would have the same hash as that is probably, you know, 350 characters long. There's no way of knowing. Being by the, this is like a side note. Um, in a hashing algorithm, if um, a security researcher finds something that can reliably generate the same hash as something else, that's called a collision, hash collision. And that's usually when a uh, hashing function gets retired. <laughs> um, but even then, that's not like, oh no, anybody can fake passwords. They like found a collision somewhere. And like even that is like, shows the ha hashing al algorithm wasn't that good. Cool. Um, so that's what we're doing here. Any other questions before we get hands on? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question. What makes it secure or not? Because yeah, if somebody is like hanging out right here, yoink, I'll take that. Worse, I'm going to take that and then keep it going so you don't even know that I got it. Everything looks fine to you. So let's say I'm here. I, uh, I jack your request because I'm snooping, snooping the network. Now I have your very not hashed username and password. Uh-oh. I may know what prevents that from happening. That's exactly what it is. So HTTPS is encrypted. So before I even send the thing, there's this thing called a TLS handshake that happens back and forth where we agree on a, on a way to encrypt the thing that I'm about to send you. So I'm gonna encrypt this, you know how to decrypt it, cool, here we go. And so if this man in the middle, which happens to be the name of that attack, uh, happens to intercept this request, they just get a bunch of encrypted garbage. So it's not flawless. However, this is where certificate authorities come in. So you may notice when you go to a website, this little lock. It says, this connection is secure because the certificate was issued to GitHub Incorporated. And it'll probably say who did it. Yep. Uh, verified by DigiCert Incorporated. Uh, so there's a third party in this. And the expectation is that I trust DigiCert and GitHub trust DigiCert. And so um, we're also verifying that um, through a third party that like I'm talking to the person that I think that I'm talking to. Um, and also um, something about that three-step handshake that even if you were able to snoop in on that doesn't necessarily mean that you could decrypt uh, the traffic. And it also happens at a lower level than HTTP. And if you're interested in that, read my write-up on HTTPS. Um, this talks about the TLS handshake. Cool, what else? Any other questions before we start doing this?
All right, let's get dirty. So the first thing that I want you to do is make a, I'll write it down, a Rails API um, that can create a user model. So we need the route, we need the controller, we need the model, we need the migration. In the migration, uh, username is going to be a string, and then password underscore digest is also going to be a string. Get this far, we'll do the next part together. Just user. And the only um, uh, action you need is create. Don't forget to do dash dash API. You'll be sad if you don't. Hmm? Uh, username. Um, this doesn't actually matter. It could be email if you want it to. This has to be exactly this. This is a special magic word. This is just something that identifies the user. Username, email, real name, ID, whatever.
All right, eyes back up here. We'll do this all together. So if you're still working, uh, keep working. If your thing didn't work, it's fine. We'll do it again together. So, uh, I'm going to say Rails new dash dash API auth part one all together. Nice long name. Okay, so make that app. And then I'm going to cd into it, auth part one all together. Uh, Rails S, I'm using port something somewhere, who fucking knows. So I'm going to set it to port 8500. I'm going to Rails G, a model for user. Oops, need to be in the right place. I'm going to Rails G model user. Uh, Rails G controller users. And over in my editor. In my routes, I'm going to resources users only create. In the controllers, controller. I'm going to create and then say a user is user.create user params. I'm going to make user params def user params. Take this, Miriam. <laughs> um, params dot require. for not using strong params in this lesson. All right. All right. And then render JSON. OK, simple enough. I have a top level key called user, and inside of it, I'm going to permit username and password. Uh, I pass those into user create, and then I send it back after I make it. Then in the migration, do a t.string for username and a t.string for password digest. I run that migration. And then tra -la, la if I do that, that all goes through. I don't want to send password digest, though. I want to send password. But when I do that, it's going to go womp womp, unknown attribute password. So you should be able to get this far. Give me a uh, fist of five, which is, or fist is, I don't know what we're doing. Uh, fist is, got it. Where are you at right now? User what? Controller. No problem. When I get sent this from the browser, it should be password. The migration, the thing that's in the database should be password digest. Cool. Anybody else not there yet? Let me help out. Users plural. No, not there. It would be in your router. Like it would be a router. Yeah, that's what I mean. Uh, to use 
Any other wonky issues? Good. Is that what you're after? It's because um, uh, if you if you just did password, that's allowed through the strong params, but there's no field for that in the database. So there's nothing nothing to save there. Uh, and then if you did password digest, it should have been stopped by the strong params. Oh, Alexis, that's why yours is happening. Other questions? Cool. Let's hash this fucking thing. John? So, if I leave the at symbol off of here, what does that change like in Ruby terms? What's the difference between those? Ooh, almost. So this is an instance variable. This is a local variable. So, we don't really talk about this very much in the program, but you can have a hierarchy of controllers. If something's an instance variable, other things in that um, in that like hierarchy can also see those instance variables. For example, um, as we'll talk about in the third lesson, so I authenticate a user. I probably don't. I don't want to do that here necessarily. I probably want something in the application controller because everything can see that. So if I store the user that I looked up, I verified who they are, and I want to make that user available to everything that needs it. I can save it as the instance variable at user in the application controller. And now, every other um, method that uses that, dogs controller, uh, uh, posts controller, comments controller, all those things, will have an at user available that's equal to like the logged in user because they can see it between those method calls. So we should always do this way. Yeah. Unless we for, for, the, for this kind of thing. Unless we inherit it. Sort of, yeah. That's an okay way to think about it. 
Um, cool. Other questions? Let's get hashing. So to hash these, what we're going to do is go over to the gem file. And you're going to go down to this commented out line that says uh, bcrypt. And you're going to uncomment it out. That's step one. Step two, we're going to bundle install. Because we added a new dependency to the app, we need to install it. Cool. Step three, we're going to go into our user model, which should look like this right now. And we're going to use the macro has secure password. Then, since we added a dependency, we're going to kill our server and start it again. And now, when I submit this, username f password digest some hash. Again, uncomment out, uncomment out bcrypt. So that's our hashing tool. You're going to bundle install because we added a new dependency. Every time you add a new dependency, you need to kill your Rails server and start it again. The only thing code-wise that we need to change is putting has secure password in the user model. What? Uh, so bcrypt lets us use has secure password. What has secure password does is it translates password into password digest. And that is what a bcrypted hash looks like. Yeah.
User, username, password. Go back over the body in that program mm -hmm. real quick. Yours looks right, John. Let's uh, touch base on that after class. Um, cool. Other questions about this thus far? That's literally it. All it takes to have somebody sign up for an account. You create something just like you would any other CRUD thing, and in Rails, has secure password will handle hashing that for you. Also handles the lookup too for next time. Uh, you don't actually like do a double equals or something to compare hashed passwords. Uh, you do a take the user model, you get an instance of it, like that user's uh, matching instance with like find by username or something like that, and then called dot authenticate and put the password into it. And it will return true if they match, false if they don't. 
even if we were doing this by hand, like we have to in Node. Node is different. So, so in Node, I bring in the bcrypt module, and when I'm making a new user, I hash the password, I take my hash password, I insert it into the database, and then give them the thing comes back. It's the same shit. Just a lot more manual. One other thing I want to talk about before we wrap. Let's take a look at that hash that I got back. The actual password hash is only this thing after the dot. This is the hash. 2A is the version of the algorithm. 12 is the cost. You could do uh, cheap hashes or expensive hashes. The difference is um, how much computation went into making it. So the expectation is higher cost takes longer to do, but it's more random. So even mega super pattern matching super supercomputer couldn't predict what your password was. They also take longer to do. So you can make a cost of 25 and it'll take half an hour to log in. But when I first started in this business, that was like an eight. <laughs> so as users' computers get faster, like log, you can raise that without ruining the user experience. But also, a cracker's computer gets faster too. So just inch that cost up over the years. But this thing in between, Patrick, do you know what that is? The salt. The salt. A salt? I thought it was more of a battery. Um, so, can you educate us why we use salts? Nope, that's where I was. <laughs> I, I literally, I was watching the video and got the salt and was like, oh, let's go to the real class. <laughs> awesome. So, all right. So I have this hashing algorithm. Let's say it's a good one. Let's say that my password is cat, and the resulting hash for that is p4xwt. Awesome, killer hashing algorithm. Now, actually, instead of cat, What if my password was blank 182 exclamation point? Cool, so that's the hash of that password. Let me see where I'm going with this. This is one of the most common passwords in the world. It's like a top 10, no shit. This, nothing has ever made me feel older. But <laughs> um, password, password one two three four, also common. Exact same hash. So let's say you crack my database. It's all hash passwords. And what you see as you're looking across these is like some of those hashes keep kind of showing up. So there's a couple of them that show up a ton, some of them that show up a little bit less often, and then some of them that are kind of random. So the distribution ends up kind of looking like that. Um, anybody know the name of that distribution? So Poisson. Um, so these are Poisson dis distributed. So every once in a while, some security researcher publishes a list of commonly used passwords that have a distribution like this. So if I take your cracked uh, uh, database of password hashes, and I see some kind of distribution like this in the hashes, and 
I happen to know that the most frequently used passwords also kind of have this distribution. Guess what? I can kind of guess what your, at least some subset of your passwords are. This is called a frequency attack. If you're using a common, a common password and I get your hash passwords, I can still probably guess what your password was. So the way that I get around this is with a salt. So if Blink182 hashes to this, but Blink182 exclamation point uh, AX1512, that would hash to something completely different. And blink 182P29B uh, B, that hashes to something completely different. So if I have some randomly generated characters that I just tack onto the end of your password and then hash this, all right. And what's really cool about this is this doesn't even need to be a secret. That doesn't give you any hints as to what the resulting hash is, because the avalanche. Small change, big change. So if in the password hash I have that salt, then what the algorithm is doing is taking F, my original password, adding that to the end of it, and hashing that, and storing that. So now, we both have F as a password. We have very different hashes in the database. Frequency t attack, averted. Randomly generated, it's just noise. Exactly. And I don't have to know my salt or anything like that. It's just published right here. So when I look this hash up in the database, this is what that um, dot authenticate method is going to do. Is it's going to look at this, it's going to take these characters, add them to whatever I send over, hash that, and see if the hash turns into this. That doesn't matter. At a, at a minimum, it prevents somebody from doing this attack. Because now there isn't a bunch of the same hashes in the database. Uh, I imagine that came about because someone got hacked and it was a pretty big deal. And huge security change. Not really. Like salting passwords. Like this is, security researchers are a very particular kind of mathematician. They didn't get caught off guard by this. Like they probably knew that this was a risk, but once upon a time it was considered infeasible or something. Salting authentication. Let's see, see if there's a history of it. Yeah, it goes back to the 70s, so. Yeah. Um, cool. So, I'm trying to use anything else I wanted to talk about in this. Oh yeah. Uh, one other thing about hashes. So hash isn't like a particular like mathy thing, it's not even named after Randolph Hash or something. It's hash browns. When you're making hash browns on a big griddle, put some potatoes in there, you mix them around, you get some more, you kind of mix those in, get some more, you mix those in, and you can't tell where any particular part of the potato, like which one it came from after a while, because you just mixed them up so well. And then if you want it to taste different, you put some salt on it. That's, that's where that comes from. Um, uh, Randolph Hash and Will, William F. Salt. <laughs> um, 
But it's like there are a lot of things like that. Like currying is a programming idea. Currying is when you um, when you uh, invoke. They have a function that returns a function, which might also return a function, uh, and so you end up doing something like some function. And you invoke it with something. If that returns a function, then you can just keep calling all these returned functions. This is called currying. That was named after Haskell Curry, um, who was a mathematician. Back when mathematicians looked like this. <laughs> um, but yeah, Haskell, Brooks, Curry. Uh, there are three programming languages named after him, Haskell, Brook, and Curry, as well as the concept of Curry. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'm going to send out the survey now. Uh, we're going to go into feelings. We're going to split feelings into three groups. We've got to figure out what those are, but stand by. Uh, you got a survey to do anyway. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, so the Cool. It is. So there's a comic about it. It's an XKCD comic for everything. This is why that's gibberish. So here's like a super secure password. Um, but we have common substitutions like O becomes zero. Um, four becomes A, that kind of thing. So we have how much randomness exists on this and how many guesses you have to make. We've also made it really difficult to remember. The problem is that a computer is super good at guessing random shit like this. Especially like with rules, like that's a common substitution. Um, so that's the first thing I'm gonna try. So we made it easy to guess, difficult to remember. Correct horse battery staples, like the original XKCD password. It's four random words that is difficult as fuck to guess, but easy to remember because you can draw a funny little picture in your head. Through 20 years of effort, we've successfully trained everyone to use passwords that are hard for humans to remember, but easy for computers to guess. <laughs> But your IT guy at the company really wants you to have an exclamation point. Doesn't matter. Cool. Anything else? Uh oh. Yeah, that's probably weird. So you just didn't get salted? Strange. Oh, uh, never mind. Maybe it's not the um, it's not the dot. It dot. It's like the first six characters after this, or something like that. Maybe a dot is one of the valid hashing okay. things. Cool. Anything else? All right. Survey going out. <laughs>